Hello, myself, Dr. Nagaraj Barla. I'm working as senior consultant, critical care at Apollo Health City, Jubilee Hills. Today, I'm going to discuss about cerebral sinus venous thrombosis. I am going to tell about this presentation in three headings, case-based approach, diagnostic approach, and evidence-based treatment modalities. So, a 31 years old female with a post medical history significant of her, uh, like uh, upper extremity of deep venous thrombosis a decade prior presented to the emergency department with chief complaints of altered mental status. The history was obtained from the patient's husband as her condition allowed only minimal participation in the history and physical exam. Symptoms had developed over the preceding 24 hours, beginning with a mild headache, which is progressing to stupor, aphasia, and finally urinary incontinence. The husband stated the symptoms began gradually, adding that the patient's only medication was an oral estrogen-containing contraceptives. She had been in her usual status of health prior to onset of symptoms in the prior 24 hours. The patient was febrile with vital signs in the normal range for her age. Her physical exam was notable for a well-nourished, well-developed young woman without apparent signs of distress. There were no focal abnormalities to her neurological exam as noted in the emergency department. And also there were no signs of trauma on her physical exam. Her Glasgow coma scale was 10 she was aroused only to the painful stimuli and was not following commands. Her blood glucose was within normal limits. Her laboratory workup in the emergency department was unremarkable. The patient was deemed stable enough to go to the radiology suit. A frontal lobe intraparenchymal hemorrhage with evidence of early transtentorial herniation was noted on non contrast CT image. The differential diagnosis include an arterial venous malformation, tumor, or a hemorrhagic conversion of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis. In the emergency department, she was treated with mannitol, intravenous dexamethasone, and levetiracetam for size and prophylaxis. The on-call neurosurgeon was consulted to see the patient in the emergency department, and the decision was made to proceed to the operating room. The patient was admitted to the neurosurgical service and underwent a decompressive craniectomy. When she was stable postoperatively, the diagnosis of a superior sagittal sinus thrombosis was made with magnetic resonance venogram. This imaging was not done in preoperative period due to technical issues. She was started on a heparin infusion postoperatively after the diagnosis was confirmed. Following surgery, the patient was transferred to a major transfer receiving hospital for postoperative and rehabilitation care. The patient had an excellent recovery. She was discharged from the hospital functionally independent and able to return to work in her previous career field. So coming to the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, it occurs when a blood clot forms in the brain's venous sinuses. This prevents blood from draining out of the brain. As a result, blood cells may break and leak blood into the brain tissues forming a hemorrhage. CSVT is a rare form of venous thromboembolism and based on the time of onset of clinical symptoms, it can be divided into three subtypes. Acute, that means uh, the symptoms will develop within 48 hours. Subacute means the symptoms will be from greater than 48 hours to within 30 days and chronic means greater than one month. The most common form of CSVT is the subacute type which constitutes almost half of the cases and the chronic form is less frequent. The ISCVT, it means International Study on Cerebral Vein and Dural Sinus Thrombosis determined the occurrence of CSVT in various sites. Out of that, transverse sinus constitutes the major percentage of CSVT, followed by superior sagittal sinus, followed by straight sinus, and later cortical veins, jugular veins, vein of gallon, and internal cerebral veins. See, this is the superior sagittal sinus, which accounts for 62%, and followed by transverse sinus. Transverse sinus lateral, uh, or lateral so is 41 to 45%. On two sides, it constitutes 82%. And all other things. So coming to the pathogenesis, when there is obstruction of dural sinuses, there is increased venous pressure. This increased venous pressure leads to increased venular and capillary pressure, 
This increased vein, venular and capillary pressure leads to decreased capillary perfusion. This decreased capillary perfusion leads to decreased cerebral perfusion. And so there is a decreased cerebral blood flow. There is a failure of energetic metabolism, which leads to cytotoxic edema. And the increased venous, uh, venular and capillary pressure leads to venous and capillary rupture, which causes parenchymal hemorrhage. This increased venular and capillary pressure leads to disruption of blood-brain barrier disruption, which leads to vasogenic edema. So increased venular and capillary pressure leads to cytotoxic edema, parenchymal hemorrhage, and vasogenic edema. The increased venous pressure causes impairment of cerebrospinal fluid absorption, which leads to increased intracranial pressure. For all these mechanisms, CSVT is uh, formed. Coming to clinical aspects, cerebral vein and dural sinus thrombosis has a highly variable clinical presentation. Symptoms and signs of CSVT can be grouped into three major syndromes. Isolated intracranial hypertension syndrome, which presents with headache with or without vomiting, papillo edema, and visual problems. Focal syndromes include focal deficits, seizures, or both. Encephalopathy includes multifocal signs, mental status changes, stupor, or coma. Along with the major, these three major, less common presentations include cavernous sinus syndrome, subarachnoid hemorrhage, and multiple cranial nerve palsies. A case of cerebral venous sinus thrombosis mimicking a transient ischemic attack also been reported. Isolated sinus and venous thrombosis. Isolated thrombosis of the different sinuses and veins produces diverse clinical pictures. If it is in the cavernous sinus thrombosis territory, ocular signs dominate the clinical picture with orbital pain, chemosis, proptosis, and oculomotor palsies. Isolated cortical vein occlusion produces motor or sensory deficits and seizures. With sagittal sinus occlusion, motor deficits, bilateral deficits, and seizures are frequent. Patients with isolated lateral sinus thrombosis frequently presents with isolated headache, intracranial hypertension. Like this, based upon the different entities, it will present with different symptoms. Coming to the diagnosis, the diagnosis of CSVT should be suspected in patients who present with one or more of the following clinical features. There is a new onset headache. Even the headache patient is having with features which differs from the usual pattern. Example, progression or change in the attack frequency, severity in patients with the previous primary headache. Symptoms are signs of intracranial hypertension, encephalopathy, focal neurological symptoms and signs, especially those not fitting a specific vascular distribution or those involving multiple vascular territories and also seizures. In addition, the diagnosis of CSVT should be suspected in patients who have atypical neuroimaging features on routine CT scan or MRI at presentation, such as cerebral infection, cerebral infarction that crosses typical arterial boundaries, hemorrhagic infarction, or lobar intracerebral hemorrhage of otherwise unclear origin. In any of these scenarios, suspicion for CVT should be particularly high for patients with known risk factors, including prothrombin condition, prothrombotic conditions such as usage of oral contraceptive pills, pregnancy and the puerperium, cancer patients, infection and head injury patients, even if the initial neuroimaging study is normal. When urgent imaging is required, for any patient with suspected CSVT, an urgent brain MRI with MR venogram is recommended. Brain CT with CT venography is an acceptable alternative when MRI is not available. The clear demonstration of absence of flow and intraluminal venous thrombi by CT or MRI is the most important finding for confirming the diagnosis. However, these findings are not always evident and the diagnosis may rest on imaging features demonstrated by MR venography, and MR venography or CT venography showing only absence of flow, flow in a venous sinus or cortical vein. Coming to CT scan, CT is often the first investigation to be performed in clinical practice and it is useful to rule out other acute or subacute cerebral disorders. But head CT is normal in up to 30% of CVT cases. In about one third of the cases, CT demonstrates direct signs of uh, CVT. In the, uh, in the diagram, here it is showing non contrast CT scan, it shows a hyperdense thrombosed cortical vein. This in the figure B, it is showing non-contrast CT, showing the hyper 
density in, in the uh, in this area and the straight sinus large arrow uh, head which is a direct sign of dural sinus thrombosis which is known as dense triangle sign in the uh, uh, diagram c it is showing a non filling defect of the confluent sinus after contrast injection it is known as the empty delta sign indirect signs of cvt on head ct are more frequent this include intense contrast enhancement of the falx and tentorium dilated transcerebral veins small ventricles and parenchymal abnormalities in addition associated brain lesions may be detected in 60 to 80% of patients with cvt there may be hemorrhagic or non hemorrhagic ct venography is often normal in patients with cvt head ct is often normal in patients with cvt ct venography demonstrates filling defects sinus valve enhancement and increased collateral venous drain so these are the uh, this uh, csvt with the surrounding edema there is a filling defect here and the uh, there is a like uh, mass effect with the, all the uh, surrounding edema all this uh, feature suggest of csvt so guidelines from the american heart association or american stroke association published in 2011 consider ct venography to be uh, at least equivalent to mr venography in the diagnosis of cvt compared with digital subtraction intra arterial angiography the combination of head ct and ct venography has a sensitivity and specificity of 95 to 95 91% respectively the disadvantage of uh, ct ctv over mrv is ctv is poor at imaging deeper veins when compared to mrv MRI using gradient echo T2 susceptibility weighted sequences in combination with MR venography is the most sensitive imaging method for demonstrating the throm thrombus and the occluded dural sinus or vein. MR venography, MR venography usually performed using the time of flight technique is useful for demonstrating the absence of flow in cerebral venous sinuses. the interpretation can be confounded by normal anatomical variants such as sinus hypoplasia and asymmetric flow conventional angiography when it is required is cerebral intraarterial angiography is recommended mainly when the diagnosis of cvt is uncertain such as in the rare suspected cases of isolated cortical vein thrombosis or when the clinical suspicion for csvt is high but ct venography or mr venography is inconclusive coming to laboratory diagnosis routine laboratory tests which are required are complete blood count biochemistry panel prothrombin and time aptt and where who are suspecting uh, csvt the findings from these tests may suggest the presence of conditions that contribute to the development of csvt such as the underlying hypercoagulable state infection or inflammatory process d dimer has an elevated plasma d dimer supports the diagnosis of csvt but a normal d dimer does not exclude the diagnosis in patients who are suggestive of symptoms of unpredisposing factors lumbar puncture may be useful to exclude meningitis in patients with uh, uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis who present with isolated intracranial hypertension evaluation of thrombophilic state when appropriate screening should include antithrombin protein c protein s factor 5 leiden prothrombin g20210a pathologic variant lupus anticoagulant anti cardiolipin and anti beta 2 glycoprotein 1 antibodies treatment modalities are broadly divided into acute anti thrombotic management elevated intracranial pressure and herniation management and management of convulsions or seizures so acute anti thrombotic treatment includes for adults with symptomatic cerebral venous sinus thrombosis with or without hemorrhagic venous infarction initial anticoagulation therapy with subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin or intravenous heparin is recommended which is a grade 1c for children with csvt with or without significant secondary hemorrhage initial anticoagulation therapy with subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin or intravenous heparin is recommended which is grade 2c evidence suggests that subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin is more effective than unfractionated heparin definitive evidence of effectiveness is lack lacking but there is a general consensus that anticoagulation is appropriate for csvt so there are two randomized control trials of anticoagulation in acute uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis have been published both have methodological problems most importantly their modest sample size they include berlin trial and dutch trial 
in berlin train was stopped prematurely because of excess mortality in the placebo arm that's trail there is no difference between uh, the, uh, the patient group and the control group the difference between the groups was not statistically significant this uh, in when compared to the when uh, coming to the risk of new intracerebral hemorrhage anticoagulants appears to be safe in adults patients with csvd who have associated intracranial hemorrhage in the both in berlin and dutch trials 34 out of 79 patients included in the berlin and dutch trials had an intracranial hemorrhage at baseline none of the patients randomized to heparin developed a new intracerebral hemorrhage in contrast a new intracerebral hemorrhage developed in three patients randomized to placebo so as a uh, summary of the clinical management when there is any clinical suspicion of cortical uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis the ideal diagnostic is uh, mri with mr venogram if the mri with mr venogram is not available then do ct with ct venogram if the cerebral venous sinus thrombosis is confirmed then start with anticoagulation either with low molecular weight heparin or unfractionated heparin if the cvd confirmed diagnosis is not uh, obvious then consider other diagnosis here you have to when going to anticoagulation you have to see the risk score the prognostic score for uh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis uh, these prognostic variables include malignancy coma deep venous thrombosis mental status disturbances male sex and intracerebral uh, intracranial hemorrhage the risk factors accordingly for uh, malignancy two points coma 2 points dvt 2 points mental status disturbance 1 point male sex 1 point and intracranial hemorrhage 1 point so if the anticoagulation if the risk score is uh, greater than 3 then consider and endovascular treatment when during the consideration of the endovascular treatment all multidisciplinary team of doctors neurologists neurosurgeons interventional radiologists and the intensivists should take a combined decision if the risk score is less than 3 then consider anticoagulation if there is midline shift herniation pca territory uh, uh, posterior cerebral artery territory hypodensity then go for decompressive craniectomy oral anticoagulation if there is one episode of csvt with transient risk factors 3 to 6 months of oral anticoagulation is required if there is one episode of csvt with unknown cause then 6 to 12 months of oral anticoagulation is required if there are two or more episodes of oh, cerebral venous sinus thrombosis or one episode and a severe prothrombotic condition then lifelong oral anticoagulation is required this is in broad the summary of oh, 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 treatment so coming to the endovascular treatment for adults and children with cvt who develop progressive neurological worsening despite adequate anticoagulation with subcutaneous low molecular weight heparin or intravascular heparin intravenous heparin endovascular thrombolysis or mechanical thrombectomy at centers experienced with this center methods may be treatment options however the limited available evidence suggests no benefit a randomized control trial known as to act trial failed to show the benefit of endovascular treatment so that is thrombectomy with or without chemical thrombolysis over anticoagulation in patients with acute cvt coming to management of elevated intracranial pressure and herniation in the acute phase elevated intracranial pressure may arise from single or multiple large hemorrhagic lesions in fox or brain edema elevated icp or space occupying lesions may cause transitorial herniation and death uh, so to prevent that elevation of the head end of the bed intensive care unit admission mild sedation administration of uh, asthmatic therapy like manitol or hypertensive saline and icp intracranial pressure monitoring all this required during uh, to control the intracranial pressure in patients with impending herniation due to unilateral hemispheric lesion hemicraniectomy can be life saving there is no good evidence to support ventricular shunting as a treatment for acute hydrocephalus or impending brain herniation in the acute phase of cvt in patients with sustained icp elevation successful treatment of intracranial hypertension can prevent visual failure and resolve headache thank you